Okay, well, you know, welcome everybody to the Algebra of Particles in Quantum Theory Seminar Series. My name is Nicole Fury, and I'm grateful to be able to bring to you um, several, uh, a selection of speakers that I would say are making a genuine effort um, and also genuine progress uh, towards a deeper understanding of fundamental physics. Um, now, everybody that showed up uh, here today is here to learn, and so I hope that everyone feels comfortable enough to raise their hand and ask a question throughout the talk if they have one. Um, you know, if you accidentally ask a silly question, it's not a big deal, you know, we've all done it. Now you just pick yourself back up again and try again next time. Um, so I would especially like to encourage, uh, I would especially like to encourage questions from graduate students, upper level undergraduates, postdocs, and also people from um, who are generally underrepresented in our field. Okay, so with that said, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Lucien Hardy. And Lucien is a professor at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada. He received his PhD from Durham University in the UK and since then has been responsible for several major contributions in our understanding of quantum theory. As a postdoc in Rome, Lucien collaborated in an experiment to demonstrate quantum teleportation. In 1992, Lucien devised a thought experiment which demonstrates quantum non-locality in a scenario now known as Hardy's paradox. In 2001, Lucien produced a widely popular axiomatic reconstruction of quantum theory based on five reasonable axioms. And in 2005, he initiated a new research framework with the intent of finding a theory for quantum gravity. This framework is known as the causaloid approach to quantum theory, and it's what he's going to be explaining for us today. Um, so Lucien, please feel free anytime. Great, so thank you. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be giving the first um, uh, colloquium, as uh, they're now uh, uh, coined. Um, um, and um, so this one is going to be about the, the causaloid framework. Um, so I'm happy to take uh, questions, uh, interruptions uh, during during this uh, presentation. And I'm, I'm doing it on paper. This is an old technology uh, using a pen. Um, and um, so it'll be easy for me to answer questions just by uh, drawing on, on this paper. Um, OK. so. Um, and for the most part, I'm just going to be writing on the paper, though I have a few slides at the beginning prepared. Um, great. Okay, so um, so a question, the, the problem we want to address is, is the problem of quantum gravity. And, and really this is uh, simply stated, it's to find a theory that limits to quantum theory on the one hand and to general relativity on the other hand as, as appropriate uh, in, you know, in, in, the, in the empirical situations where those theories have been verified, we want our theory to limit to those theories. Um, it, it may be that quantum gravity is, 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 a, uh, is, is a theory that's ex expressed in a very different mathematical framework from either general relativity or quantum theory. You know, indeed, historically, uh, general relativity is expressed in a very different mathematical framework from from Newtonian physics that came before it. Um, so it, it could be that something similar uh, happens here. Uh, and so the question is, uh, you know, how do we how do we find that theory? Or even even before we do that, how do we find the right mathematical framework in which to formulate that theory? Uh, so the problem with with this is the arrows are pointing in this direction, from something we don't yet have to two things that we do have. And we really want to be sort of find a way to invert the arrows, a, a sort of methodological way of inverting the arrows so we can go about constructing this theory of quantum gravity. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is one idea about, about how you might do that. Um, so we begin by noting um, 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 the, the two um, less fundamental theories we're talking about here, general relativity and quantum theory, they each have kind of complementary conservative and radical features. Um, so I'll just adjust this a little bit. There we are. Um, so um, general relativity is, uh, has the conservative feature that it's a deterministic theory, uh, like uh, previous theories. Uh, 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 and quantum theory has the conservative feature that it, it's, it's uh, formulated with respect to some fixed uh, background causal structure. Uh, general relativity has the radical feature uh, that the dynamical structure 
So the causal structure is dynamical. It's something you actually solve for. So in general relativity, typically you solve for the metric, uh, G mu nu, and, and the metric tells you, um, you know, if you have two events, it tells you, um, if the, you know, it tells you whether these events are space-like or time-like. Now, since, since this is something you're solving for, uh, uh, that means that the, the metric itself, the, the metric is dynamical, and therefore the causal structure uh, is dynamical. Um, quantum theory has the radical property of indefiniteness. So, for example, if um, if you have a particle that can go through one of two slits, um, then in some sense there's no matter of the fact as to whether the particle goes through the upper slit or the lower slit. In some sense, it goes through both slits at the same time. Uh, and correspondingly, you you have to use uh, probabilities uh, in quantum theory. In some sense, uh, uh, quantum theory is inherently probabilistic. Um, so, um, so um, what we want, it seems that once you have these radical features creeping into physics, uh, then they're here to stay. And so the proposal is uh, for quantum gravity, we want a probabilistic framework that admits uh, indefinite causal structure. What I mean by that is that uh, you can have something like a quantum superposition of different causal structures. Uh, this means that um, there will be no matter of the fact as to what the causal structure is uh, in, in, a, in a generic situation. Um, okay. Actually, one thing I'd like to do is elaborate a little bit more on the fixed causal structure in, in quantum theory. So one way to see that is that quantum theory is a theory in which you evolve a, a wave function forward in time. So uh, you evolve from one space-like surface to the next space-like surface. Um, uh, and the notion of space-like surfaces uh, doesn't make sense if you have indefinite causal structure. It's something that prefers, uh, um, at the very least, to, to having um, definite causal structure. Um, and, and typically that's taken to be some given causal structure. Um, but there's another way in which you, have, um, you, you use a fixed causal structure in quantum theory. So let me just draw a, an example here. So imagine you have um, two qubits coming in and they're going through a sequence of boxes. Okay, like this, box A, box B, C, D, like that. Um, and you might ask, what's the, um, the pertinent mathematical object uh, if you're discussing boxes A and box and B? Okay, well, in that case, you would typically take something like a, a tensor product uh, of operators pertaining to those boxes. Now, what about if you're talking about boxes um, B and C? Um, and B and C, you would typically take a, um, you would take a, a direct product like this. Um, so you know, this would be, if, there was, if, these, if these were represented as matrices, this would be matrix multiplication. Um, and so this is a different, a different product, and, and the kind of product you use depends on the causal situation. So in one case, in the first case, you have space-like separation. In the second case, you have causal adjacency. Um, C immediately follows B. There's another case you can consider. What about if you're interested in boxes B and D? Uh, well, in that case, you can define what I call the question mark product, which um, is um, B question mark D. Okay. And B question mark D, you can define it um, like this. B question mark D acting on C is equal to B is equal to um, C, um, sorry, I, um, equal to um, D, C, B, okay. Um, so, and, and this, 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 is, um, this is a sort of linear uh, operation that acts on operation C. And so this is a different kind of product. You don't normally see this in the textbooks, um, but it's, it's something you can define mathematically. Uh, so you can see now you have three different types of ways of combining these operators. And the type of method you choose uh, depends on the causal situation. Uh, and it's different mathematical machinery, it seems, in each case. So it would be nice to unify all these different types of product 
uh, under uh, under a single product. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there any questions before I move on? Yes, uh, uh, Lucien. Uh, so you are using uh, the word uh, causal structure, uh, not not exactly in the sense that it's used in GR, because in GR uh, they, uh, that that's something like the conformal class of the metric. It's called causal structure. But when you say that something has a fixed causal structure, you you I I take it that you're meaning some like a foliation um, of the space time is fixed. Um. I mean, so, it, so in, in GR, you know, like you would, people say that nine tenths of the metric is causal structure. There's, there's one extra tenth, which is to do with um, the conformal uh, factor. Uh, and, and I think, and that, that is what I mean, um, just that so intervals are, are space like and time like. Uh, I mean, at this level, I have to admit, I'm using it in a kind of loose way because I'm talking about different theories. You know, in the context of quantum theory, in, in, in the context of this example with qubits, um, you have. Um, you know gates and the causal structure is in the wiring is in the way that the qubit passes between the the, the, the gates uh, and so in different theories the, the thing that you might want to call causal structure appears in, in different ways um, and in, in any case what I want to do is, is formulate a theory in a, in a way that doesn't refer to some some given causal structure but somehow allows it to be uh, indefinite yeah so okay. I hope that goes some way to answering that question thank you yeah is there any more questions? Okay. Um, right. So, um, so the, the framework that um, I've developed, uh, as Cole said, is, is the causal loop framework. Uh, that was something I started working on in 2005, and I wrote a few subsequent papers. Um, my, my PhD student, uh, Nitika, um, Sakawada it is uh, currently finishing her PhD, that it should be finished by tomorrow. Uh, and uh, in her thesis, um, she has uh, lots of uh, new results on, on the uh, causal framework. Uh, and so, and uh, um, in particular, she has some diagrammatic um, language, which I think is useful. So I'll employ some of that uh, during this talk. Um, and then the whole subject of indefinite causal structure uh, was taken up by other people. So uh, work by Kirabella uh, et al. Uh, so Kirabella, uh, Mara Dariano, uh, uh, Perinotti, uh, and Valeron. Um, and they developed a sort of mathematical framework uh, which was closer to quantum theory and was uh, uh, admitted some kind of indefinite causal st structure. Uh, and in that, they they they, talk, they gave this example of a quantum switch, uh, and recently experiments have been done to 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 uh, on the quantum switch. So there's a whole um, a whole um, uh, a whole lot of papers that have been written on that framework, and then also um, uh, Oreshkov uh, et al. So Oreshkov, Costa, and Bruckner. Uh, in 2011, um, wrote uh, a paper uh, on indefinite causal order where they wrote down some sort of bell type inequalities that um, that would pertain to situations where you had definite causal order, um, and and then showed and then showed how a framework they developed violated those inequalities. So there's been a tremendous amount of work, uh, especially following on from these papers, which were motivated uh, to some extent by the the causaloid uh, papers. Uh, however, the actual framework that these papers use is, is not the same as the causaloid framework, uh, uh, which is in some, in some ways it's a more general framework. So I think it's worthwhile me just going back into that framework, the causaloid framework, because I think it's it could be quite useful if you're interested in the problem of quantum gravity. Okay. Um, so the causaloid framework has at its heart this idea of physical compression. Uh, and it consists of three types of compression. I'll explain this uh, more clearly in a moment. Tomographic, compositional, 
uh, and meta. Um, these particular names for the types of compression were introduced by, um, by Nittiger. Um, so I'll explain what tomographic compression is, compositional compression, and meta compression is uh, uh, over the course of this um, talk. Before I go on to the, um, the causal wave framework, I want to sort of take an aside and look at um, tomographic compression uh, in the context of um, quantum theory. So, so in quantum theory, um, um, consider an example like this. You have some preparation and you have some measurement. Okay, the preparation is associated with a density matrix, and then the measurement is associated with a, uh, an operator. And let's consider it where it's a preparation for a single spin half particle, a qubit. In that case, the density matrix is given by an object like this. So this is a, a matrix. It has the probability of spin up along the z direction and the probability of spin down along the z direction on the diagonal. Then it has some complex numbers, complex number, and it's a joint on the off diagonal. Um, and this um, A, this complex number, can be written like this. Okay, so the key point is that this is a linear um, function of the probabilities um, associated with um, spin measurements along the x, y, and z directions. Uh, so that means that actually this density matrix here has the same information in it as this object. Um, so it has the same information as the um, probability spin up along the z direction, probability down, spin down along the z direction, probability spin up along the x direction, and probability spin up along the y direction. Okay. If you know this object, then you have this object and vice versa. And indeed, they are linearly related to one another. Okay. Um, are, you, um, are you going to explain uh, what you gain by rewriting things in terms of a column as opposed to uh, as opposed to a permission matrix? Well, then, yeah, I can, I can answer that question. So there's this whole subject of general probability theories. Um, if, if you write quantum theory in terms of density matrix, density matrices, then you're really uh, you're writing it within the quantum formalism as it stands. Um, but if you write states as lists of probabilities, then you're you're writing them in, in a more general mathematical framework. And in that more general mathematical framework, you can also write down other, other theories as well. Uh, so you can see um, how they relate to more general uh, mathematical theories. Um, okay, so it's, so the idea is basically so that you can you can frame all kinds of theories in in terms of the same the yeah. same the same framework. On, on the other hand, you might also wonder if um, you know there might be algebraic properties that uh, you lose in in writing things simply as a column. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. You do. But the question is, can you regain those things, and what does it take to regain those things in in the context of of this more general framework. Um, and, um, and in some ways, these three levels of compression that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, speak to that, although I won't have time to show everything you have to write down to regain quantum theory. But, um, but um, in some ways, it's so taking something apart and putting it back together again is, 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 is one way to see how it works. And, and this, is what, this is what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I, I see Lev has his hand up. Good to see you, Lev, by the way. Sorry, but okay, uh, I, I want to just understand. You have probability Z up, probability Z down, probability X up, and probability Y up. Mm -hmm. So does it be, uh, I'm not, it's, you have a qubit and this probability, if you measure Z, then 
Does PZ down equal one minus PZ up? Or it's oh. not? So actually, so for, for, for other reasons, although I don't want to go into this here, it's, it's useful to work with states which aren't necessarily normalized. Um, so that's the reason I, I wrote this down. Like I could just put a one here if it was normalized, but I, I, I wrote it down like this. And, and it, it, you see the linear structure more clearly if you work with states which are not necessarily normalized. Uh, and I, I, could talk, I could talk to that for a long time, but it would, it, yeah, it would take me away from the main subject here. Um, um, but yeah, it's, it's very useful to work with states which aren't normalized. I mean, it has to do with what it is you're trying to calculate. If you're trying to calculate a joint probability, and imagine, for example, you have this, this box here has some outcome on it, and this one has an outcome on it. Then if you're interested in the joint probability of seeing um, this outcome and this outcome, then the object you write down for this density matrix uh, wouldn't be normalized. It would only be normalized when you add these density matrices over all those different outcomes. Um, so if you want to work in, in terms of joint probabilities instead of conditional probabilities, it's useful not to normalize. Uh, and furthermore, that means that everything is linear. Uh, you don't have these uh, nonlinear dividing factors, these normalizing factors. So okay. just to be sure, so PC down is not one, one minus PZ up. In, 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 in general, no, no. Yeah, if if you admit if you have if your preparation device has an, can have an outcome on it, um, then um, the total probability of uh, in here of seeing um, p z up plus p z down, um, it may be less than one because you may you also have to have this probability here. If yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Welcome. Okay, good. So, um, so you can see um, what one thing that's interesting is is once you've got this device, this list of just four probabilities, it's possible to calculate any probability um, for for this system. So, uh, let me see if I can represent that. What, what I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to put an alpha here, just a label here, alpha, to indicate, or just this just labels the different measurements you can make uh, in, in this box. And you have the probability associated with each of those measurements, P alpha. That's right here, P alpha. Uh, and P alpha is given by in quantum theory by the trace of the operator associated with that measurement times the density matrix. Okay. Um, and you can write that down as R alpha dot P. So because because um, um, the density matrix is linear in this vector P, um, these things are linear relate linear related. That means that, and the trace is a linear operator, is, is a linear um, uh, thing as well. That means you can write down this um, trace of um, A on rho as R dot P, okay, where these things are linearly related as well. Okay. Um, so you can see now that. Um, all these, um, all these probabilities p alpha, you can have a list of all the, this is a very long list of all the possible measurements you could perform and write down the probability. In fact, it turns out you only need, in order to calculate these, it's possible to calculate them from a much smaller list, which is these ones. And so this is the physical, this is the tomographic compression I was talking about. Um, and you can even imagine that that is given by a linear formula. So you can, you can write P alpha is equal to um, some
So you can write um, that P alpha is given by um, some rectangular matrix multiplying um, um, P L and P L and L just labels the um, the entries in this. So that labels these probabilities. Okay. I'm going to call this set of L labels uh, omega. Uh, this is a, a, a fiducial set. If you know the probabilities for the fiducial set, uh, then you can calculate all other probabilities. This And this is tomographic compression. Okay. Okay, and this, this, uh, these ideas I've just explained are are, are basic to um, the whole area of GPTs, um, general probability theories, um, and and that's been a big subject uh, in uh, recent years, uh, sort of general mathematical framework within which you can cast. Uh, quantum theory, you can also cast um, classical probability theory uh, and, and other theories as well can be cast in this much more general framework. Uh, and this idea of tomographic compression, as we're calling it here, um, is basic to that framework. Okay. Um, so it's, it's going to be useful to represent what I've just done here diagrammatically. So I'm going to, I'll write this equation down again. P um, that equation, you can write it down as in diagrams like this. So those of you familiar with this kind of um, Penrose, just let the camera refocus. Okay. There we go. Um, in this kinds of this kinds of Penrose diagrammatics uh, are quite useful to to see these equations, uh, especially the the ones that involve composite systems uh, more easily. Um, you can also write down this equation. Um, that P alpha equals R alpha dot P. Uh, write it down in this diagrammatic notation. And you can even go one step further and write it down like this. Okay, so this is um, this is just the same as that equation, and, and this one here is the same as this equation. But of course, we're summing over repeated indices, indices in all of these expressions. Um, okay, and this this, this notation uh, was developed by uh, Nitika Sakawada in her uh, thesis. Okay. So that's the idea of uh, tomographic compression. What I want to do now is to go over to um, setting up the causal loop framework. So the idea is to consider some very general experiments uh, and, and, and um, try to write down a framework that would pertain to those general kinds of experiments. So here, here's one experiment. Imagine you have um, a source, okay, emits some particles and then you perform a sequence of of measurements of spin along various angles as it goes along. So, 
And at each stage, um, you have, um, well, you have the location here, this, here's the source. So you have the, here, the, the source is at location zero. Uh, this, this is at location one. This can be at location two and three. Uh, and you write down on a piece of paper at each stage um, some data. So here you would have um, the angle at which you orient the, um, the measurement. And here you have the outcome, which might be plus or minus one. Let's call it plus one in the first case. Here, here you have another measurement uh, along the angle theta two, and you have an outcome, which I've written down as minus one, for example. This one. Um, so you have um, each, at each stage in this experiment, you, you, you collect some data, um, sort of approximate, some data in, in different locations. Uh, and just to illustrate that, we can imagine collecting this data on cards. So this is a card with some data, this one, this one, and this one. Um, we can imagine another experiment. So for example, we might have a, a circuit And then at each location in this circuit, we might collect some information on a card. We might even have an experiment where we have some probes that float around in space. So here's some probes. And each of these probes uh, takes in data uh, at uh, unit intervals of time has an, an internal clock and it takes in data at unit, unit intervals of time. Um, and that data could be imprinted on cards again. Okay. At each, um, each, each, each unit interval, these probes which are floating around are taking the data. Um, each of these cards, we're going to suppose that the data it collects on it is like this. It has um, some data here, X, which corresponds to location. Um, I'm putting inverted commas around the word location. Um, it might be, you know, location like this. It might be location, um, for example, it could be location that's read off a GP, GPS um, device, or it could be something else. It's just some data that you collect uh, that corresponds in your way of thinking to uh, a notion of location. Okay. The next thing we have is some choice of um, of settings, so these are the knob settings. Uh, so here, the um, knob settings were the thetas, the angles, um, but it could be something else. So different experiments, you would have different uh, ideas of what you wanted there for your knob settings. And then finally, on each card, we have um, some outcome. Or outcomes. So Y denotes the different uh, outcomes, or denotes the outcome that you see. You see. So this, the situation is you're performing an experiment, you're collecting data at different locations, and the data is written on cards. Um, and now you can imagine uh, repeating this uh, many times. So, so first of all, for one, if you do the experiment once, you'll collect a whole bunch of cards, a whole stack of cards. This is my attempt to draw a stack of cards. Okay. Uh, and and you can you can shuffle those cards, um, and then you can repeat the experiment again because you want to build up some probabilistic uh, information. So you, you get you get another stack of cards, and then just to make this more um, visual, we can imagine that these cards are sent to a man who lives inside a box and has a big table in front of him. Okay, and his job is to um, analyze these cards. So these stacks of cards are sent uh, to that man who lives inside the box. And his job is to try to analyze these cards uh, and to, to find regularities and, and so on and so forth. 
um, he wants a physical theory that he can use to, to do that. Uh, and the causaloid is a, a theory, is a map article theory that allows you to do that kind of thing, the causaloid framework. Um, any, any questions before I move on? Yes, if I, uh, well, two, uh, I guess two questions. Uh, is X a space or a space time? Uh, so I'm thinking of it as being more akin to space time. Um, but um, so the idea really is, is to proceed in a way that X can be sort of what you want it to be, what, what works for the given experimental situation. Uh, you know, if, if you were trying to do general relativity, you might try to divide your space time up into small regions and X would label those different regions. Um, for example, is that why location is in quotes? Yes, that's why I put the word location in quotes, just because the, the idea is to make the framework sufficiently general that it will work for, for different um, different situations. It's, it's not, this isn't necessarily completely general, by the way. You could imagine experiments where, where this isn't enough. Um, but I think the general approach I'm going to describe is, is very general and can be adapted even to those situations. And any other? You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, so, so the so the man inside that room, he has a big table in front of him. Let's draw the tabletop. And what he's going to do is he's going to draw lots of little circles and label them with X. So each X will have somewhere on this table, doesn't matter where, a little circle uh, associated with it. And you can imagine he will deal the cards into the appropriate circles when he has a stack. Um, and then, so, and I call this here, I call this an elementary region. And then he's, and then he can also consider a whole bunch of these elementary regions uh, to make bigger regions. So call that R1, that, that consists of a whole bunch of different elementary regions. So just the union of a whole bunch of elementary regions. Um, or you could have another region, R2. Okay, and um, what he wants to do, what his objective is, is to be able to calculate things like this. The probability that you'll see certain outcomes in, say, region two. So, why remember, um, why labels the outcomes? So, so Y2 is all the different outcomes on the cards in region two, uh, given that you saw certain outcomes in region one, and then also given that you had certain knob settings in region one and two. Okay. If you can calculate this kind of thing, then you can calculate, you know, the, the sorts of probabilities you might be interested in in this situation. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to go through um, the different kinds of compression you get, um, the tomographic, compositional, and meta compression that enable you to do this kind of thing. So let's start with um, tomographic compression. Um, and for that, um, I'll start on a different piece of paper to give myself space. So for that, um, I'm just going to consider a single region, R1. Imagine that the whole, everything, all of all of the, um, let's put my pen here, help focus. Okay, imagine everything is region R. So the gap, so everything that's not in region one is in region R minus R1. Okay. Um, and we can think of this as being we have a preparation, I'm going to use inverted commas again, uh, in region R minus R1. 
So what happens in region R1? You know, normally when we use the word preparation and measurement, we have a sort of temporal notion. Um, but here, we're just gonna use those words uh, to refer to this situation, even though, um, even though the thing that's happening in region R minus R1 may not be, may not be before what's happening in region R1. Okay. And the preparation, so in region R minus R1, we have some settings. Okay, there's the dog, sorry. Um, okay, we have some settings um, and we have some outcomes. Um, and in um, region R1, oh, sorry, I've made a mistake there. That should be R minus R1. And in region R1, we have also the same thing. We have some settings. Okay. Uh, like so. Um, and now uh, we have a property. We're interested in the probability of seeing these outcomes in region one, uh, given that we had certain um, um, choices of settings. Yeah. Okay, the dog might be as angry at the moment. Um, okay. And I wanted to. to um, introduce this label alpha again. I did that before, it was useful. So just labeling what is happening in, in region one by alpha one. I'm gonna call that probability alpha one, P alpha one. Okay. So this is a joint probability. It's not a conditional probability. The thing I represent before was a conditional probability. But here I'm interested in the joint probability. The thing is, if you calculate joint probabilities, then you can always use joint probabilities to get conditional probabilities, although it's difficult to go in the opposite direction. So joint probabilities are more useful. Also, they tend to be linear. They tend to be related to one another in a linear fashion. So that's the reason I'm doing this. Okay. Can I ask quickly, um, there also seems to be quite a big generalization uh, going from, you know, just looking at, a, um, you know, devices making a measurement in a lab to suddenly what you're working on or what you're describing right now sounds very, very general. Yeah. Um, do you, um, kind of what range are you, um, what is the scope of things that you're allowed, how, how general are you allowed to make this? I don't know if you see what question I'm asking. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it is much more general because these regions can correspond to data that's collected in very different locations. Uh, so for this to work, it does need to be the case. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I realized I've made a, no, no, this is all good. Okay, it, so, so for this to work, it needs to be the case that for the total region, because what we have here is really just the total region. Um, for the total region, the property is, is well-defined, is, is well-conditioned. So over the whole experiment, you have, when you do the experiment, you have it, you get the same, you get, you get a well-defined uh, probability. Uh, as long as that works, uh, then I can write this object down and everything I'm going to do subsequently works. I'm just going to... Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to use the same tom tomographic compression I used before, the same machinery I, I used before, but now in this much more general context. And that's okay. There's nothing to stop me doing that. Mathematically, it's perfectly allowed. Um, okay. Right. Um, and so it's useful to, to draw these diagrams like I drew before. Um, this is uh, Nitika's notation.
think the dog is not very interested in the causal loop framework. Okay, so you have these, the, uh, rather than writing all the equations down symbolically, I'm just writing them down mathematically. Um, so you can see here you have the compression. So if your physical theory has some structure, um, then you will be able to compress from this big list of properties down to a smaller list of properties. And there'll be this object, this um, lambda matrix here uh, that does the compression for you. Incidentally, actually, your, your, your question just now, Cole, um, in order for this to be non-trivial, there has to be some non-trivial compression here. If, 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 there's no, if there's no physics in what you're doing, if nothing is related to anything else, then this, this will end, all end up being trivial. But if this matrix is, is, um, is, is rectangular, which means that there are fewer L1s than there are alpha ones, uh, then you have some actual compression, then, then, then it's useful. Um, and um, the L1s belong to a reduced set, uh, Omega 1. Um, so I, I notice when I did it by handwriting that the Omegas and the Lambdas look very similar. So I hope, I hope I'm making them quite different. Okay, so so yeah, L L belongs L one belongs to this. This is the compressed set, whereas alpha belongs to a much bigger set of all the possible things you could have. Um, I think I typically call that epsilon. Um, <clears throat> so um, the compression is in the the, the size of these sets. So if this set is much much bigger. If this, such is, if, this, if this set is bigger than this set, then you have some compression and your physical theory is doing something for you. Otherwise, physics is not doing anything for you. Okay, so this is tomographic compression. Um, and that's the, the first kind of compression that you need. Let me now talk about the second kind of compression um, which is compositional compression. So now we want to consider um, where you have two or more regions. Uh, like this, uh, and then we're going to write down um, same kind of expression, but now we have two regions. Okay, so I'm writing down a similar expression to before. And I think I've just managed to fit it on the page there. Okay. And we can regard this composite region here as if it were a single region and perform the same kind of compression I just showed you before. Okay. So let me, let me write that diagrammatically. So here's P. Alpha 1, alpha 2. I can just compress that. Um, using uh, a, a compression matrix. Okay. 
So there's, there's nothing different here from what I did before. It's just um, I'm writing, I'm regarding this as a single region, but it's now got alpha one and alpha two as labels. So this 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 equation here is really the same thing as this one. Okay. Um, now, sorry, I've, I've made a mistake. It's not evident at this stage. I want to represent these as k's. Okay. I'm going to use k's. Um, well, you'll you'll see the reason for it. Um, these k's belong to um, some set of fiducial. Um, um, just like previously, we had a fiducial set over here for the L's. Now, uh, for the K's, uh, I have a fiducial set as well. Okay. And what you can show is that this fiducial set is it can be written as a subset of the of the Cartesian product of the fiducial sets for each of these taken separately. Okay. There's just a few lines of mathematical proof to, to prove that. Um, so the next thing I want to do is show you how, how, how this is. So this is just the same. This is just tomographic compression. But now I want to show you how you can think, how you can get compositional compression. Because what you can do so I'll draw the diagram. What you can do is you can think of this compression as first of all compressing separately on each of the regions using um, the matrix we had before and then whatever compression is left over to be done you can do that um, using uh, another matrix okay um, so this object here is the same as this object here okay and what we have now is is this this object here is performing compositional compression. You know, uh, earlier I said how you sort of have to if you take something apart and put it together again, you can start to see how it works. And you can see uh, in these cases, um, you see you you start to see that the, the thing that really gives structure. Uh, it, um, it, it, it is compositional structure is in this com this compositional compression matrices, um, and in the example I gave you much earlier, um, let me just find that. I gave you this example earlier of these different products. Um, interestingly, the first one and the third one are, are trivial. What I mean by trivial is is that this the uh, omega one two is just equal to omega one cross omega two, and it's only the second case where you get non-trivial compression, where you get a reduction in the number of parameters required. So, so this um, this this uh, compositional compression. Um, tells you a lot about um, about uh, what is going on. It tells you about um, causal adjacency, for example. If you have non-trivial compression in quantum theory, it means that you have causal adjacency. Okay, so I realized uh, I'm getting towards the end of the time. Um, 
So I'm going to, um, is, um, I, should, I assume it's going to be like an hour, a one hour talk roughly, is that right, Cole? Yes, but I, um, I think it's a little bit flexible. Okay, well, I'll do my best not to go too far over. Okay, so that's compositional compression. And, and the same idea, so I, I showed you compositional compression for just for two regions, but you can easily extend this to three regions. You add an extra wire, and extra wires here, everywhere you just add, add extra wires, the same thing works, or four regions. Uh, some, so, so you can do compositional compression for, for any number of uh, different regions. And that's the same basic, basic idea. Question? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, just, just to, to understand, so for example, at a product state versus an entangled state, is that what, uh, that's an example of trivial versus non-trivial? Um, um, it's, it's a different, it's a slightly different thing. I think that there's, there's a relationship between these two things, but, um, well, let's see, it's, it's really, it's really to do with product properties of the set of states or properties of the set of operations okay so the, the set of all states in quantum theory if you have um if you have a um a preparation um the set of all states is um uh, belongs to a space which is um which includes entangled states and product states um so 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 it's not quite like that uh, think of it more as being um, to do with the example I showed you earlier. So this example here. So in quantum theory, if you want to characterize what happens, what's associated with this here, um, A and B, you would typically write down the tensor product of, this, of the, the map associated with A with the map associated with B. Uh, and in that case, um, the number of parameters is associated with this object is just a product of the number of parameters you had with, with this one and this one. Okay, so you have a kind of omega one cross omega two situation. Whereas in this example, because you perform matrix multiplication, you're losing some parameters. So you have fewer parameters in here than you have in the product. So, so you can see it has to do with causal adjacency. So it's not really to do with product states and entangled states as such. It's, it's speaking to a different part of the formalism. Is this kind of related to how you can define uh, algebras this way, right? Where you just, you take the kind of general products by uh, putting things together with the tensor product and then you divide out by some ideal and it, um, so it, 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 may, it, makes, it, it makes identifications. It kind of cuts out some of the information. It, it may be, I haven't, I haven't explored that particular avenue, but it, okay. it may relate to that. Yeah. Okay, so let me, um, let me move on to, um, on to, on to meta compression, which is really just a, a more simple idea. Um, So meta compression. So if if you know, so in the way I've set things up, if you know all the compression matrices associated with tomographic compression, sorry about the dog. Uh, and also, so if you know all of this, and if also you know all of the um, compression matrices associated with um, with um, compositional compression, okay. Okay, so you know these for, for, for different numbers of regions. So you know them for, you know these for two regions, for three regions, for four regions and so on. Um, um, then it's possible to do any compression. You can um, you can um, you can you can get all the information you need, and essentially you've characterized fully the physics that's inside 
uh, your system. Um, okay, um, but it turns out in physical theories, you don't have to specify this, this much information. It's possible to specify less information to capture all the physics. And this is the meta compression. So, um, so typically, you would only have to specify this object. Um, you have to specify all the um, all the tomographic compression matrices. And then you have to specify the composition compression matrices only up to only up to um, a certain number of systems. Okay, so starting with two systems. Up to ones that have D systems. Okay. Um, even though the, no the total number of regions uh, might be much greater than D. Okay. So, um, and, and then it, and then if you've got these compression matrices, there are, there are equations that enable you to calculate an arbitrary compression matrix. Okay. And I'm not going to have time to explain uh, where these equations come from. Um, so, so, um, we, so, so Nitika calls this um, um, desufficiency, or let's, let's call it decomposition deficiency, uh, uh, sufficiency. Okay, so two composition sufficiency means that it's, it's only necessary to have um, these matrices, these compression matrices for up to two systems, up to, up to two regions. Uh, three composition sufficiency means you have to have them up to three regions and so on. Okay. Now it turns out that quantum theory uh, is two composition sufficient. Um, in fact, circuit theories in general in general are two are, are two composition sufficient. Um, you can cast you can cast general relativity as a circuit theory. So this also includes well, I, 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 probabilistic general relativity in in, in uh, two thousand and sixteen. Uh, I wrote a paper showing how to put um, general relativity. Uh, into this kind of framework, uh, and um, in this language, you would say that general relativity was two composition sufficient. But what you can see here is that a whole hierarchy of theories is being suggested, uh, ones which only require um, two um, so two elementary region compression, and then ones which require more than that. Okay, um, and um, so this 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 object here is the causaloid. And if you know the causaloid, then you can calculate all the physics, all the probabilities in, in, in the physical situation that you're interested in. Um, okay, let's see, is there any other points I should make, I think? Um, um, so you've seen that you've got tomographic compression, compositional compression, and then finally, there's this sort of meta compression and then a big question is, uh, what about quantum gravity? Uh, is quantum gravity going to be a two comp sufficient theory? Or will we need to um, uh, go into uh, higher rungs on this hierarchy? Will we need to look at um, higher levels of, uh, of compression uh, in order to um, not to formulate quantum theory, but quantum gravity? Uh, okay. Uh, well, that's. I think that's that's uh, over an hour. So I, I should I should probably not carry on talking. I'll, and I'll, I've covered the three levels of compression, so I'll, I'll stop there. 
Hey. Sorry. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Lucien, for a wonderful talk. Um, is there? Does anybody have any questions? Uh, can I ask a quick one? So um, how do how do things like uh, gauge symmetries work their way? How do they appear? How do they show up within this framework? So so I think. Um... It is, this is an operational framework and everything is couched in terms of objects that are operational. You know, typically in a gauge theory, you start with some object, um, you know, uh, where there's sort of operational redundancy that you, 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 you have you know, your, 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 your specification of the state, for example, um, has redundancy in it so that, so that, so that um, different, um, different um, different states are actually physically equivalent, operationally equivalent. Um, and so in this framework, you kind of have to take that redundancy out. So you would um, start from gauge invariant objects, right? Everything. Yeah, so, you, so you're forced at the operational level, you're forced to start with gauge uh, invariant objects. That, that doesn't mean that somewhere lurking in the background, there could be these gauge dependent objects. Um, um, but um, but once you've got data on cards, you definitely have gauge independent objects. No, no gauge transformation is going to change the data that's written on a card. Okay. Uh, is it, does anybody have another question? I've got another one. If oh, here we go, Torsten. So let me uh, unmute you. Wait. There you are. Okay, go ahead. That again? Uh, you have oh. ah okay okay um, yeah a question about uh, the duration of your approach to the uh, possible structure of space time. Does your approach say anything about uh, the structure of space time in, in the sense that uh, did you prefer uh, that uh, it follows directly from your approach for instance a discrete structure of space time or is it is it more i know it, I, I, you you spoke about an operational approach but mm. does uh, does it say any restriction on on space time uh, there was a question before about causality and foliation and all that um, mm. um and there's also another very good characterization to say okay to admit um a time like uh closed loops and then space time and such things to to prevent causality but there's different uh point of view uh to to uh, yeah to introduce it this does your approach say anything about that um so I mean, because it's conceived operationally, you know, in terms of these cards, it is necessarily discrete. Now, I, I wouldn't personally want. I mean, may, maybe, maybe fundamentally, that that you know, nature is discrete. Um, yeah. um, but I wouldn't personally want to commit to that. I mean, um, general relativity is not a discrete theory. It's it's a perfectly good theory, and it should be possible to explore its operational content. Um, and and I tried to do that in a, a paper in two thousand and sixteen. Um, I mean, there I took the approach of um, sort of defining a kind of operational space, which is slightly because you know, the, the space of GR is is um, is um, is not operational. You know, you, the, you can perform diffeomorphisms and, and get what looks like look, what looks like a different solution, but it has the same physics content. So the manifold space is, is not the right place to do operational uh, physics, but you can try to build an operational space. Uh, but then to to, to fit it into this kind of discrete sort of model, uh, I divided the, that space, operational space, into into finite regions, uh, and imagined oh, fitting them together. Okay. So, yeah. um, so, so it doesn't give you, you know, the full the full sort of um, continuous. Uh, it, 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 whilst, whilst, whilst of course you can do that to general relativity, it's it's not as beautiful a characterization as I would like. It would be nice mm -hmm. to see. Um, to see the um the continuous picture coming through um so um so i think i think my dog has opinions <laughs> yeah. on this too um I disagree maybe yeah yeah she has a lot of disagreements so. um so um yeah i i definitely am not committed to discreteness or or, or continuum i'd like i'd like this approach to to be consistent with a continuous approach. okay in, yeah, in terms yeah. of that that question about um how causality is characterized um um, you, 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 you witness causality in this non-trivial compression. Uh, you witness causal adjacency in, in, in non-trivial compression. 
Mm. Um, and um, and to, the causal adjacency in, in general relativity, for example, would, would be witnessed by non-trivial compression in, in this sort of in a framework I, I set up. Um, uh, so it's a very different way of thinking about causality, but it's I think it's the same concept. Okay, maybe maybe one little objection because uh, you, we, we spoke about um, causality also in kind of foliations, yeah. And if you uh, agree that uh, if we have uh, the the set of leaves and a foliation uh, yeah. which representing uh, some st uh, systems uh, mm -hmm. in, in physics, then it is known from from uh, non commutative geometry first examples or which can use what that the uh, the set or the, the space of all leaves of foliation cannot be described appropriately by by commutative algebras you need operator algebras you need factor two or three uh, algebras to characterize such foliation maybe so you need in that context an operational approach to characterize mm -hmm. foliations and then causality and, and also in general relativity mm -hmm. so mean, maybe it's not 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 so maybe it's discrete is is one way but uh, at, at, uh, at the first view, you cannot admit it as uh, a continuous approach, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, 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 um, I haven't thought about the particular example you gave, but I wouldn't, so foliation is meant to be, is, is not meant to appear in this approach. It's, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Foliation is really, course, a, really course. a bad way to think about uh, causality because it's, uh, there are many different foliations. Um, um, what, what, but one comment that I think maybe is is interesting, which I, I didn't have time to talk about, um, you know, if you if you have if you have definite causal structure, then you can allow yourself to think about special shaped regions in um, in building up your your theory. So if you, if you're thinking about time evolution, then your special shaped regions are just big big rectangles. So this is the mm -hmm. past. You know, this expands overall space, and and then you go to another. So this will be the foliation, and then you have a, a, a new, a new, a new, a new thing here. So now you have a bigger, another rectangle. So, or you, uh, so, so you can think in terms of special shaped regions if if you have definite causal structure in the background, uh, or you can think in terms of you know like diamonds, causal diamonds, and, and, and joining them together or something like this. Um, if if you have indefinite causal structure, um, then you cannot use causal structure to define special shaped regions. Uh, and so you have to do your physics in such a way that you can you can make it refer to any any shape in in your your space because you don't have special shapes to to rely on. Uh, and I didn't have a chance to explain this, but well, maybe it's kind of clear. The causal law framework you can consider any arbitrary region R one, and you can have any shape you like, uh, okay. and you can show how to join together some mathematical objects pertaining to different regions. So it's one of the selling points of this, the, the thing that makes it um, useful for indefinite causal structure is that you can um, do it for arbitrary shaped regions. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't think I covered all of you, what you asked, but it, this is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Good. It looks like Carlos has a question. Oh. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, thank you, Nicole. So this is very fascinating, and I was wondering if you take already questions from experimentalists. Please, in the please. sense of, <laughs> in the sense, have you casted uh, some uh, density matrices already into cal uh, into causaloids, um, or do we have to figure this out by ourselves to actually design experiments and so on? Um, and so I have shown. So thank coming you. out of the work I've described here is is. Um, I wrote various papers uh, casting quantum theory explicitly into this framework. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how how useful that would be if you want to do an experiment. Um, um, uh, right, yeah. I can elaborate maybe. So what we usually do in condensed matter, for instance, is to just we have these toy models, uh, and uh, um, and then we just solve them just with uh, very simple. Uh, um, um, let's say Hamiltonians, right? And then we mm -hmm. we we base our experiments on that, right? So, mm -hmm. and of course there are boundary problems and there are all kind of uh, issues arising, but we kind of have, kind of wave or wave uh, or way around them, mm -hmm. and uh, we just want we know that these toy models have been 
uh, um, very well uh, established, let's say. So um, let's say some of these toy models are also from Alice Hitayev, who, who does uh, many of, of uh, both condensed matter and, and general relativity. Um, so um, have, have, do you have some examples or do you plan also to introduce uh, some of these models? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have any examples. Um, um, and yeah, you know, I haven't, I haven't, um, I mean, I, 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 I guess different people have different notions of what they mean by abstract. Mm -hmm. So I th think I would, I would freely admit that what I did here was, 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 was on the abstract side. Um, but for me, the less abstract stuff is where I put, say, the quantum circuit model in, into this framework. But I think that's already, already still quite abstract. Um, if, if you want to consider specific examples. Um, so yeah, I, I, can't, I can't claim I've done that. Um, the, the, in terms of what you just said, the one, the one thing that might be interesting is, is these boundary conditions. Um, you know, we, we normally take an attitude to boundary conditions uh, that requires, you know, that requires um, notions of definite causal structure. We have initial conditions and, and final conditions and so on. Um, and, and that's a problem if you have indefinite causal structure. Uh, and, um, and, and the way of thinking in this approach is, is, is different. Um, I'm not sure if I have time to ex explain this. Um, you know, normally, you, 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 if you get the boundary conditions correct, then you can make predictions. You know, so you, you need boundary conditions. Uh, and it's kind of an art, you know, you, you, you sort of people know what kinds of boundary conditions to impose in order to get predictions. Um, the approach here, which I, I didn't have time to elaborate on, um, is, is to sort of turn this around and to have what, I, what, what I've been calling prediction heralding. Which is where you write down some general mathematical condition Uh, which tells you whether or not the situation you're considering will, will have a, a well-defined probability associated with it. Um, okay. And then, and then if, if, if it does, then you can have, you have an equation to tell you what the probability is equal to. So, so you, rather than um, imposing boundary conditions to get predictions, you, you just write, you, you, you write down, you have a, a general mathematical condition that you can use to say if predictions are, are possible or not. You know, because in, in general, in, in physics, most things are not predicted. You know, if I, if I say, you know, what is the probability that if I drop this pen, uh, Trump will become president of the United States yet again? Well, that's, that's, that's not really a proposition that, that has a well-conditioned probability associated with it. So in physics, we're typically very clever at finding uh, statements that do have probabilities associated with them through the use of, um, usually through the use of boundary conditions. Um, but there's a different way of doing that, which is to have a mathematical, a general mathematical condition that tells you when you can make predictions um, and when you can't. Um, and so that does appear here. But I'm afraid it's all still very abstract and it's maybe not uh, what you're looking for. Wolfgang, uh, you've got a question. I'm going to mute you here. Hello. Hi, Lucien. Thank you. For, hi, hi, how you doing? Very well, for, the nice, for the nice talk. So I've, um, as far as I understand, the logic really is that different theories of uh, quantum gravity will all be compatible with this framework. So what I would like to understand is how, how where, where would the difference be? Would they be only in the in the um, actual model to calculate, for instance, probabilities, but is it also the, the label sets, the alphas, so to say, that mm -hmm. would be different? So uh, the basic question is really just how, how can we, how, where, where would we have to look for um, uh, realizing different uh, <laughs> gravity in this framework and where would different theories uh, differ in this logic? Okay, so I mean, first of all, I, I, I want to. Um, I'm not sure this is quite the very general framework that we need for quantum gravity. It um, you know, even at the very beginning, I, I considered limited notions of collecting data, and, it, and maybe more general ways of collecting data. 
uh, first. Secondly, it's it's a discrete framework, and and we may to to we may want uh, continuous parameters to to appropriately construct a framework. Um, if if the theory fits, if you have a theory that fits in this framework, whether it's quantum gravity or, or anything else, then the thing that gives you the theory is this is this causaloid, um, and um, so the causaloid is is given by specifying the, the, these these matrices. Um, up to a certain d, up to a certain number of um, of elementary regions, um, and furthermore, there are uh, equations between these matrices which are really fixed by the. Um, I didn't have time to talk about those equations, but they're really fixed by the um, the omega sets, how the omega sets relate to each other. So, how the omega sets for different numbers of regions relate to each other. Uh, helps fix the equations that uh, really relate this. So um, yeah, so it's all in the the causaloid. Uh, hence um, uh, the name of the framework. So just a quick follow up question. So do I understand uh, correctly that different theories would agree on on the alphas, for instance? On oh um, no, I mean the, the alphas are coming from. Um, what things you measure, uh, and so, um, so, so. I mean, in some sense, um, but just to, in, if I may yeah. interrupt, I mean, different theories may tell you that different things are um, that some things are not observable at all, that they are not elements of your uh, yeah. theory. So that they, they mm -hmm. could, in that sense, I mean, perhaps also the alphas. Yeah, so so the alphas here, because of the way it's constructed, uh, they're labeling um, properties of these cards, and so they do have to correspond to things you you can measure. However, um, you know who tells you in the first place what it is you can measure? And there's some quote I think, I think and it's probably due to Einstein, maybe it's someone else. You know, that a physical theory should also tell you what it is you can measure, uh, and and this this kind of operational approach doesn't do that. Um, so there's something missing in the operational approach um, there. Um, you, you need to know what it is you can measure in order to know how those things are related. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's a question, and that's not one that I can answer within this framework. OK, thanks. But this uh, really uh, clarifies the, the idea and everything. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Jorge, uh, you have a question, and we're going to. OK, go ahead. Can, oh, try again. Okay. There we go. OK, I think okay. we should hear you. OK, well, thank you very much for a very nice and exciting uh, lecture. Um, I, okay. I wonder whether your framework allows for closed time-like curves, or there is something in it that it prevents them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, um, So if, if you can consistently formulate theories that have closed time like curves in them, you know, if, if these things exist in a consistent manner, then then it also be possible to operationalize those and describe them in a framework like this. Uh, however, I haven't haven't actually tried to do that. You know, there are these solutions um, to in general relativity that have closed time like curves in them. Um, and um, I think they would exist in this framework um and one one okay one issue is um is to do with agency here i imagine that you have agents who can make choices so they can choose with the knob settings um and um so of course once you have agents making choices then you run the chance of of uh of grandfather uh, paradoxes um and so it'd be interesting to see how what what happened uh, in that case. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question, and I, I really haven't done the the, the the work to be able to answer the, the question uh, appropriately. But I, I think it would be fun to look at that. Um, I mean, in, indefinite causal structure um, is 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 weird anyway because um, so closed time like loops you can understand those even if you have definite causal structure. You just have loops that go backwards. 
indefinite causal structure is, is where it just even the notion of time and space become fuzzy in some sense. And so what's to stop something like a loop appearing in, in there? Uh, these, these are all good questions and I, I really don't have the, um, the, I don't have the answers. Wolfgang, do you have a question again? Uh, no, thank you. Oh. Uh, it's... Okay. Uh, it's... Ah, right. sorry. I did not. <laughs> That's right. Um, oh, my hand. Okay, so Le uh, Lev, do you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Le Lucien. It's, you know, for me, maybe it's really not, not a e an easy formalism. So if I'm... Uh, if I'm not trying to solve quantum gravity and I'm not, and I'm forget about gravity, mm -hmm. uh, are there a reason for me to try to study it or uh, the standard formalism of quantum mechanics give, uh, it doesn't give any advantages over standard quantum formalism? Um, I mean, I think it depends what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, you know, if, if you're, um, let me see. So, um, well, here's one reason you might be interested in. You know, you, you've played a big role in um, in the whole pre and post selected um, um, way of thinking. So that's that's um, that's um, that's um, and that, of course, lots of important insights come through that way of thinking. Um, you know, these these regions, um, the, the, the way I set up the framework, these regions can really have any shape, and so so you know, region. Although I drew them as circles, they could actually be things like this. You know, like this, and so um, so this will be a way to explore the the pre and post selected um, framework. Um, um, so, um, uh, but in in a more general context, so perhaps perhaps that might appeal to you if you if you're interested in looking at pre and post selection in in a more general uh, uh, context. Um, yeah, and and actually, even if you look at the ABL formula, so. This is um, for other people. This is a formula that's uh, used to calculate probabilities where you have some pre-selection and some post-selection. Then you're interested in the probabilities of a measurement at an intermediate time. This is the aharonov berkman leibovitz formula, which Lev knows very well. Um, that formula uh, uh, has an, a non-linear term. You have the numerator divided by the, uh, the, the denominator. The, non the denominator um, uh, depends on what choices you make in intermediate time in, in a way that that's not true in, in, in physics generally. And you can understand that fact in this framework, uh, in, 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 a, in a more general framework. So you can shed some light on, on what's happening there, I think. So um, so I think the interaction between um, pre and post selected examples, which you have come up with many, uh, and the sort of more general ideas might might be interesting to, to you, Lev. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but may I ask you what do you mean more general? More general is that there is something wrong with quantum mechanics, and we can uh, enlarge it, generalize to, G to some GPTs. This is what you mean more general. Well, more general in, in two ways. So yes, more general in that way that you just mentioned, and then also more general that um, you know pre and post selection is 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 one example, but you can have um, you can have selection selection which is not just pre or post but sort of all over the place causally um and then and then and then and then you're looking for the probabilities associated with with other stuff which is also all over the place causally um so more general in that sense as well yeah. okay so that, that may be interesting to, to, uh, to you love and, and this then relates to there's a lot of work being done on um Quantum combs. I'm not sure if you've followed this work, Lev. Quantum yeah. what? Quantum combs. So, um, so in quantum papers on quantum combs, you always get these kinds of things. This is a comb, um, and um, you have systems coming in and going out of the comb, and then you can perform, you can put things in here. So you can see this is sort of like an elaboration on the idea of pre and post selection. You can perform experiments here. Uh, which are pre, mid, and post selected. Oh, of course. Yeah. So, and, and of course, you also have you got in in, in um. There's also um. I forget what it's called now. In in the uh, um. There's also the um. 
the something like that. The political formalism, of course, deals yeah. with this kind of. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So, um, so I think there's 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 a whole lot of different ideas that are connected there, and I, I think they're interesting. But um, yeah, that, that's that's the best answer I can give to, to you, Lev. Thank you. A uh, question from Felipe. Go ahead. Um, yes. Hello. Uh, so it's a naive question because I'm an experimentalist from quantum optics, so I'm very far from quantum gravity. But so I would like to come back to experiments. So for me, a problem with quantum gravity is that there are basically no or very little experiment. We have no playground to make prediction, measure things, test things, etc. But still, there are many attempts. Uh, there are attempts in uh, quantum optics in Vienna, Philip Walter. There is also all the nanomechanics experiment. And uh, on the complete other side, there are all the new experiments with black holes in interferometry, etc. So can you, do you have any hint of where, what kind of experiment may be relevant uh, with respect to your framework? Where, where can, where is there some hope to measure something, test something, tell something? Uh, or are you too abstract? Uh... Yeah, I'm afraid. I, I think it, it, it is in some ways too abstract. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's the problem with being it's, it's both too abstract and also too general. Uh, and in order to do physics, you, you need to be less abstract and 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 less general because ultimately physics is described by you know a, a single a single. What theory. about these? Sorry, Lucy. What, what about these experiments where um, these yeah, indef indefinite uh, indefinite causal hmm. order uh, experiments um, that yeah so I was going to talk about that so I think I mean the, the sort of line of thinking that we're, we're starting with here where we talk about indefinite causal structure it did lead you know other people uh, such as uh, Kiribella, Dariano, Pernotti and, and Valeron to um, to propose the quantum switch and then people have thought of ways to actually to do the quantum switch and that experiment has been done uh, and you could if you wanted apply this framework um, um, I mean, this this framework is is more general than the framework that um, that uh, Kiribella et al. invented, or um, the framework that um, Chastav Bruckner and Anion and Costa invented. Um, so you you could you could formulate their framework inside this framework um, and look at those experiments. Um, but, but I'm not sure not sure that would add anything i think i think at this point the real point of this this kind of way of thinking is is, is uh is in theory construction trying to get a, a grip on on quantum gravity in a more general framework so um in some ways it's ironic because i start by talking about experiments and operational data and yet actually it's too abstract really it's not about specific experiments and so for that i apologize okay so experimentalists cannot help at that stage yeah, not at this stage, but maybe maybe in five years' time. I mean, I I have the greatest respect, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have the greatest respect, of course, for experiments. I spent two years of my academic life um, in experimental laboratories in Innsbruck when Anton was there, and uh, in Rome with Francesco De Martini, uh, and um, seeing. I mean, in some in some ways, the, the direction of influence has been the, the the other direction. It's been me looking at experiments and seeing how that makes you think about physics the way physics should be um, formulated. Um, so this this kind of approach was very much influenced by those years working in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I can pay you back eventually, but at this, at this stage, it's too abstract, I'm afraid. And the, on the black hole side, uh, nothing else ever? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have, I don't have, um, yeah, I don't have anything really to say about black holes. Um, um, from the point of view of this framework, uh, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I, I, I do have a project thinking about black holes and operationalism, but it's um, um, but that's also very nascent. So I, I don't have anything very, very concrete to say at this stage. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now might actually be a, a good time to, to close things off. Um, yeah, I wanna say uh, thank you very much to, to Lucien for giving an, an excellent talk. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, it also I uh, wanted to say thanks to Shadi uh, Talvidar Zadev for co-hosting with me and also um, for, to uh, Hilary uh, Cartier for picking up on the, uh, the daylight savings changes, which um, could have caused all kinds of confusion with the talk time. Yeah, um, that, that would have, I would have missed it. Thank you, Hilary. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
Um, so in two weeks time, I'm happy to, to let everyone know that we, um, we've got our next speaker who is Anna Pachol from Queen Mary in London. Um, Anna uh, gave a talk for the math department in Cambridge not long ago, and I would say it was my favorite talk um, during my time there. Um, Anna will be telling us about her work on something called digital quantum geometry. So thank you again to Lucien for an excellent talk, and, and especially thank you to everybody for so many really great, great questions. And I uh, hope to see you again in two weeks. Thank you.